hello boys and girls welcome to another english lesson i hope you are all keeping well and it's like i always like to say english is fun repeat after me english is fun so as promised today we are going to look at phrases and clauses what are we going to look at phrases and clauses and i hope you would have done your research so it's going to make today's class even better let's go so phrases what is a phrase now a phrase is a group of words that functions in a sentence as a single part of speech phrases do not contain a subject and a verb so what is a phrase let's go it again a phrase is a group of words that functions in a sentence as a single part of speech and when we talk about the single part of speech as we dive deeper into the lesson you're going to understand what i'm talking about what i want you to remember at this point is that a phrase does not contain a subject and a verb so it's a group of words so grab a hold of that it's a group of words and it, they do not have a subject and a verb so let's go into the types of phrases so the first type we have here is the prepositional phrase what is it called the prepositional phrase we are not talking about a part of speech earlier so we're going into that now prepositional phrase i want you to grab a hold of what you understand from preposition and we're going to link that concept now with what a prepositional phrase is so a prepositional phrase is made up of at least two parts it's made up of at least two parts a preposition and a noun or pronoun it is made up of a preposition a noun or a pronoun that is the object of a preposition so let's take our time here don't get confused when you see object of a preposition now let's look at the example we have there we have near jungles near jungles now the preposition here is near and we have the word jungles coming after it now the object of a sentence is what receives action from the subject so when we talk about the object of the preposition we're talking about what is receiving the uh, the action of the preposition do you get that when we say object of the preposition we're talking about what is receiving the action from the preposition and in this case jungles so near where near jungles so when you think about a preposition of phrase know that it contains a preposition a noun or a pronoun and the noun or the pronoun it is the object of the preposition it is what receiving the action from the preposition okay students so it says here as well that the object of the preposition may be modified by one or more adjectives now the object now this thing that is receiving the action from the preposition you're going to find that sometimes in the prepositional phrase you have one adjective or you may have adjectives more than one so for example let's go into some examples the curies were a family of french scientists the Curies were a family of French scientists. Now we have the prepositional phrase of French scientists. Now how do we know that that is the prepositional phrase? Because the phrase starts with a preposition. What does the phrase start with? A preposition. So that's how you will be able to identify prepositional phrases. They begin with a preposition. So we have the preposition of the year and now we have the objects coming after what french scientists look at that french scientists look at it here french scientists and then we see there that french is modifying scientists it's telling us about the scientists that they are french let's look at example two for several generations the curies researched scientific questions for several generations the curies research scientific questions so the prepositional phrase where is it located in this example it's located at the beginning and it starts with the preposition for so we have for 
several generations. And then we have the objects coming after, and we have the word several modifying the word generations. Let's look at example number three. Marie Curie, with her family, studied radium. Marie Curie, with her family, studied radium. So we have the prepositional phrase where? Where is it located in this example? It's located in the middle of the sentence. And we see that it begins with a, the preposition with. With her family. Good. Now, an important point to note is that prepositional phrases can be located at any point in a sentence, any part of a sentence. It could be located at the beginning, the middle, or the end, as seen here with the three examples. Activity one. You know I love my activities. So, the instruction here says to identify the prepositional phrase in each sentence. So you are going to identify the prepositional phrase in each sentence. And I have five sentences here for you. The first one reads, During the last century, little was known about radiation. During the last century, little was known about radiation. Sentence two. Many scientists did not believe in radiation. Many scientists did not believe in radiation. Three, science changed with the discovery of radium. Science changed with the discovery of radium. Sentence four, by, by the 1900s, everyone believed in radioactivity. By the 1900s, everyone believed in radioactivity. And number five, the world changed for scientists and everyone else. The world changed for scientists and everyone else. So let's look at the answers. So for number one, the prepositional phrase begins the sentence. We have the preposition during. So what is the prepositional phrase? during the last century during the last century and i want you to note something as well with this sentence when the prepositional phrase begins or it introduces the sentence there is a comma there is a comma to separate the phrase from the other parts of the sentence number two many scientists did not believe in radiation Many scientists did not believe in radiation. Now we have the prepositional phrase at the end of the sentence and it begins at in. So we have in radiation. Number three, science changed with the discovery of radium. Science changed with the discovery of radium. Now we have the prepositional phrase where it's located at the end of the sentence with the discovery of radium and we see in that phrase something else is happening we have two prepositions with and of with and of number four by the 1900s everyone believed in radioactivity so here the prepositional phrase is located where at the end of the sentence in radioactivity and number five the world changed for scientists and everyone else. The world changed for scientists and everyone else. So where is the prepositional phrase located, students? It's located at the end of this sentence, and it, the phrase begins with a preposition, for. So I hope you guys that concept. Now, going back to the first thing I said, the phrase, it, can, it functions as a single part of speech. So we looked at prepositional phrase. Now we want to look at the adjective phrase. Now, the adjective phrase is a type of prepositional phrase. So the adjective phrase is a type of prepositional phrase. Now I want you to look at it in this way. I am a teacher. I am also a Christian. I am also a son. So I act in various capacities. Same, I want you to look at the prepositional phrase. It acts 
in various capacities. So now, let's look at what happens when the prepositional phrase acts as an adjective in the sentence. So we have that an adjective phrase is a prepositional phrase that modifies. And when you see that word modifies, modifies basically means add information to. What does it mean? To add information to. So the adjective phrase is a prepositional phrase that modifies a noun or pronoun by telling what kind or which one. And that's an important point to note. It tells us what? what kind or which one. Adjective phrases usually come after nouns. Adjective phrases usually comes after nouns. And you're going to see why this is an important point. Now let's look at the image that we have here. When we're, when we're talking about adjectives in general, they come before nouns or pronouns, right? So in the first example that we have, the tiger story begins no. So the word, the adjective tiger modifies story. It tells us what kind of story is going to begin. And then the second one, the striped tiger. Which one? The striped tiger. But when we talk about adjective phrases, the adjectives come after. Now look at it there. The story about tigers begins no. So you see where tigers? Tigers is located after the noun. And in the second example, the tiger with the stripes faced us. And you see again stripes coming after. So that's an important point to note. When we're dealing with adjective phrases, they come after the noun. Activity two. Underline each adjective phrase in the following sentences and state what word it modifies. Underline each adjective phrase in the following sentences and state what word it modifies. Number one, the tiger was a symbol of power. The tiger was a symbol of power. Number two, now tigers around the world are endangered species. No. Tigers around the world are endangered species. Number three. Three subspecies of tigers have already become extinct. Three subspecies of tigers have already become extinct. Number four. Humans are the greatest threat to the tiger. Humans are the greatest threat to the tiger. And the final sentence. Tiger hunting was once a sport for rich people. Tiger hunting was once a sport for rich people. Now let's look at the answers. The tiger was a symbol of power. The adjective phrase there is what? Of power. And it modifies what? The noun tiger. Look at it good. It modifies the noun. And you notice it's located after. Number two. Now, tigers around the world are endangered species. They are what endangered species? So where do we have the adjective phrase? It's located where? Around the world. Once again, an important point to note. Remember, the adjective phrase is a type. Of prepositional phrase so the phrase starts with a preposition don't ever forget that it starts with a preposition so that's a easy way to help you to identify the phrase so around the world and it's modifying tigers number three three subspecies of tigers have already become extinct we have the adjective phrase of tigers and that's modifying what sub species we look at it there it's modifying subspecies then we have humans are the greatest threat to the tiger where is the adjective phrase it's at the end of the sentence to the tiger and it's modifying humans and the last one tiger hunting was once a sport for rich people we have the adjective phrase located where at the end of the sentence for rich people modifying the word the noun tiger 
So let's look at the adverb phrase. So we've talked about prepositional phrases. We know that the prepositional phrase can act as an adjective. And now we're going to look at how a prepositional phrase can act as an adverb. So an adverb is a prepositional phrase that modifies a verb, an adjective, or an adverb. Let's get that clear. So the adjective phrase adds information. It tells us about verbs, adjectives, or adverbs. Now, adverbs phrases point out where, when, in what way, or to what extent. Let's go that again. It points out what? Where, when, in what way, or to what extent. Now, adverb phrases are used in the same way as one-word adverbs. But they are longer and sometimes provide more precise details. And that's an important point to note. They are longer and they can provide precise, exact details. So let's look at the image we have there. Bring your panda here. Where do you want the panda to come? Here. Next example. The parade began early. When did it begin? Early. So let's look at how it functions when it's an adverb phrase. Bring your panda bear to the desk. Look at that. Bring your panda bear. Where do you want this panda bear? To the desk. So it's modifying that. And then the second example, the parade began at exactly 11 o'clock. When it began? At exactly 11 o'clock. So in the first example, the prepositional phrase starts at to. And the second example, it starts at at. So look at how they function. The adverb by itself and when it becomes a phrase. Activity three. Underline, here I want you to underline each adverb phrase in the following sentences. I want you to do what? I want you to underline each adverb phrase in the following sentences. Number one. Grizzly bears hunt for salmon during the summer. Grizzly bears hunt for salmon during the summer. Number two. They stay near the stream and hunt. They stay near the stream and hunt. Number three. During the winter, they hibernate in a safe place. During the winter, they hibernate in a safe place. Number four. Most grizzlies dig their dens on a hillside. Most grizzlies dig their dens on a hillside. Number five. Grizzlies rarely communicate with one another through songs. Grizzlies rarely communicate with one another through songs. Now let's go to the answers. Work with me. Grizzly bears hunt for salmon during the summer. The adverb phrase starts where? For, because for, that's a preposition. For salmon during the hunt. During the summer, sorry. And it modifies what word? It modifies hunt. And what is it telling us about the hunt? It's telling us when. When is this hunting happening? During the summer. When? during the summer. So I hope you're noticing when you can identify a prepositional phrase, the question you have to ask yourself, what is it modifying? Is it modifying what kind or which one? Because if it does that, that's adjective. But it's telling me about when and where, that's adverb. Number two, they stay near the stream and hunt. Where is the adverb phrase? It begins at near. Near the stream and hunt. And that's talking, that's modifying the word stay. The word what? Stay. And that's telling us what? Where? Where is this thing? Where are they staying? Near the stream and hunt. Number three. So number three, we have during the winter. That's actually when, not where. So it's telling us about when. When do they hibernate? During the winter and in a safe place. Tells us in what way do they hibernate. So do we have that clear? So when, during the winter, and in what way? In a safe place. I notice the comma there. Remember I tell you when it begins a sentence, there's a comma. And then we have it at the end. In a safe place. And they're both modifying the word hibernate. So number four. 
Most grizzlies dig their dens on a hillside. So we have the preposition of first starting at on a hillside and it's modifying the word dig and it's telling us what? Where? Where do they dig? On a hillside. And number five, grizzlies rarely communicate with one another through sounds. So we have the, the adverb phrase starting at with one another through sounds. And that's modifying the word communicate. And that's telling us in what way do they communicate with one another through sounds. And we have two prepositions there, with and then we have it through. So do you have that clear so far? So we have, we know what a phrase is. We know their prepositional phrases and a prepositional phrase can act as an adverb or as, a, or as a, an adjective. So now let's move on to clauses. So a clause is a group of words with its own subject and verb. Now what do you notice right away? A phrase doesn't have a subject and a verb, but a clause has a subject and a verb. So anytime you have to distinguish or differentiate between the two, note that a phrase does not have a subject and a verb, but a clause has a subject and a verb. So I have a video for you, and this video is going to be about the main and subordinate clause. So I really hope that you enjoy this song. sentence we know what the sentence is about a main clause has a subject that's the thing the sentence is about the king ate his cheese the hall looks very nice my cats played the violin on their boat your dog is cute tom cut off his hair the big evil goat ran away there are two types of clause main and subordinate there are two types of clause main and subordinate But only one makes sense on its own It's the main clause But only one makes sense on its own A subordinate clause is extra information It doesn't make sense on its own A subordinate clause must start with a subordinating conjunction After although as because before Due to one since unless though After although as because before Due to one since unless though Until when If while weather Until when If while weather Until when If while weather Until when Although my house is big, unless it rains Because I fell over the chestnut tree After you finished your very long run Once I learn how to do a backflip There are two types of clause main and subordinate There are two types of clause main and subordinate But only one makes sense on its own Serial subordinate, although it is boring, main. The carpet is dirty, subordinate, since you are messy, main. The princess lost her crown, subordinate, as she doesn't always think, main. You never do your homework, subordinate, unless you're given sweets. There are two types of clause, main and subordinate. There are two types of clause main and subordinate But only one makes sense on its own But only one makes sense on its 
song. Good. So I hope that you enjoyed that song and you would have made a little note here and it was very catchy, right? It's very, very catchy. So let's look at the independent clause. An independent clause has a subject and a verb and can stand by itself as a complete sentence. What we have? An independent clause has a subject and a verb and what, what it does? It can stand by itself as a complete sentence. So this is telling us when we read an independent clause, it makes sense. It expresses a complete thought. It doesn't need any help. Independent clauses can be short or long. What is important is that the clause can express a complete thought and can stand alone by itself. Now let's look at the example here. We have, the ski lift took us up the mountain. The ski lift took us up the mountain. Now the subject of that sentence, what's the subject of this sentence? And when we talk about subject, we're talking about what the sentence is about. So, like for example, the subject we're looking at right now is English. So everything we're doing here is related to English. So the subject of this sentence word is ski lift. And what is the verb in this sentence? Took. So that is an independent clause. It has a subject and a verb. Added to that, does that sentence make sense by itself? Yes, it does. Because it's telling us what happened to the ski, ski lift. It took us up the mountain. Number two. In the morning, we practice on the beginner's slope. In the morning, we practice on the beginner's slope. So the subject of this sentence is we, and we have the verb practice. And it's telling us what about, what about we? We practice on the beginner's slope. So in the morning, we will practice on the beginner's slope. Now let's, a point I should note. The independent clause is also known as the main clause. So if you hear someone say main clause, it is the same as independent clause. You know, like for example, some of us, we have a whole name, but it's the same person. So with the subordinate clause, a subordinate clause has a subject and a verb, because remember that's what distinguishes a clause from a phrase. It has a subject and a verb, but cannot stand by itself as a complete sentence. It is only part of a sentence. So with the subordinate clause, it has a subject and a verb, but it cannot stand alone by itself as a complete sentence. Now the subordinate clause is also known as a dependent clause. What is this also known as? A dependent clause. Now let's read the following example. Number one, after she reached the top of the cliff. After she reached the top of the cliff. Now you ask yourself, what happened when she reached to the top of the cliff? Exactly, it's incomplete. It does not express a complete thought. So we have the subject she, we have the verb reach, and that's it. It needs something to complete it because that's only part of a sentence. And then with example two, when the bicycle had a flat tire. When the bicycle had a flat tire, we have a subject bicycle, we have the verb had, and that's it. So we need something more to complete it. We need something more for it to make sense. Now an important point I want to note. Remember I said the independent clause is also known as the main clause. Subordinate clause is also known as the dependent clause. How for you to remember this, I want you to think of yourself. You are a dependent clause. You depend on your parents for food, clothing, and shelter. Right? You depend, you need your parent. Versus me as a teacher, I am an independent class. I don't need my mother to provide food, clothing, and shelter for me. I can do that for myself. So that's a good way of remembering and distinguishing the two. Now, subordinate clauses, they start with subordinating conjunctions. What do they start with? Subordinating conjunctions. I remember conjunctions join. So, a subordinating conjunction is a word or phrase that links a dependent clause to an independent clause. This word or phrase indicates that a clause has informative value, meaning it's very important to add to the sentence's main idea, signaling a cause and effect relationship or a shift in time and place between two clauses. So this subordinate conjunction is a very important role because remember, we're looking at the entire sentence and that 
connects the dependent clause to the independent because remember the dependent clause needs the independent clause for it to make complete sense or to express a complete thought. So let's look, we have a list here on the screen of subordinating conjunctions after, although, as, because, before, even if, even though, if, in order to, once, provided that, rather than, since, so that, than, that, do, unless, until, when, whenever, where, whereas, wherever, whether, while, and why. And this is not an exhausted list. There are other examples of subordinating conjunctions, and I will encourage you, if you have a chance, to go look them up and do some research on them. So let's go to activity four. Label each group of words below as an independent clause or a subordinate clause. So we're going to read the sentences and we're going to decide, is this an independent clause or is it a subordinate clause? Number one, when mountain biking began in California. When mountain biking began in California. Number two. Although regular bikes did not work very well. Although regular bikes did not work very well. Number three, riders made their own bikes for their special needs. Riders made their own bikes for their special needs. Number four, mountain bikes are made of strong light metals. Mountain bikes are made of strong light metals metals and number five cyclists ride cyclists ride so let's go to the answers when mountain biking began in california does that express a complete thought no so that makes it a subordinate clause and look it starts with a subordinate conjunction when so when the independent clause is added to this to express a complete thought, to make it a sentence, a comma will be placed after California. Number two, although regular bikes did not work very well. Think about that. Although regular bikes did not work very well. Is that complete? No, it's not complete. Hence, that makes it a subordinate clause. We have the subordinating conjunction, although. Number three, Riders made their own bikes for their special needs. Riders made their own bikes for their special needs. Does that, complete, does that express a complete thought? Yes, it does. So that makes it an independent clause. Number four, mountain bikes are made of strong light metals. Mountain bikes are made of strong light metals. Does that express a complete thought? Yes, it does. So that makes it an independent clause. And number five, cyclists ride. Cyclists ride. And that's what? That's an independent clause. Now, some of you are probably asking, but sir, can a sentence have two words? Yes. And that expresses a complete thought. That's what cyclists do. Cyclists, they ride. We have a subject, cyclist, and we have the verb ride, and it expresses a complete thought. So, in conclusion, I want you to remember the following points. Number one, a phrase is a group of words that functions in a sentence as a single part of speech. Phrases do not contain a subject and a verb. Phrases do not contain a subject and a verb. Second point I want you to note, a prepositional phrase is made up of at least two parts. A preposition, a noun or pronoun that is the object of the preposition. When we say with the object, it receives the action from the preposition. Point number three. An adjective phrase is a prepositional phrase that modifies a noun or pronoun by telling what kind or which one. So when you have the prepositional phrase, if you want to know if it's an adjective phrase, if it's functioning as an adjective, ask yourself, is this telling me about what kind or which one? Point number four. A adv an adverb phrase is a prepositional phrase that modifies a verb, 
an adjective or an adverb. Adverb phrases point out where, when, in what way, or to what extent. Where, when, in what way, or to what extent. Point number five. A clause is a group of words with its own subject and verb. A clause is a group of words with its own subject and verb. That an independent clause has a subject and a verb and can stand by itself as a complete sentence. An independent clause has a subject and a verb and can stand by itself as a complete sentence. And finally, a subordinate clause, also known as a dependent clause, has a subject and a verb but cannot stand by itself as a complete sentence. It is only part of a sentence. And I want you to think of yourself as a subordinate clause. Now, this brings me to the end of today's lesson. I hope you had an enjoyable time. I knew it was a lot of information, but I hope that you had fun. Now, in our next lesson, we'll be looking at subject and predicate. What we'll be looking at? Subject and predicate. So please do your research and come, and we're going to have another enjoyable time until we meet again, Sir Jared.